Welcome back to STEM Lab, everyone. I am glad that you are here. Even though we can't have back and forth and do questions like we normally do. Um, got some good stuff today. It's a little bit of review. And at the end of today's class, I'm going to expect all of you to be taking a quiz, which can be found in our Google Classroom. Now, in order for us to move on, and talk about new things and do new things, kind of like what we talked about doing that rocket project and building rockets. I need to know that you guys are all on board and everyone's paying attention in class. So we need to have a good score on this test. There are 10 available points. If you get less than seven on this, um, I'm going to need pretty much everyone to get eight or more points on this because it is a very easy quiz. And if we don't have that happen and if we don't have everyone taking it, we're going to have to go back to doing this. So please, 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 please take the quiz. It'll be in your Google Classroom. So the laws of motion. We've talked about these quite a bit and um, they were developed by Sir Isaac Newton. There are three of them. And the first law of motion is, I think, pretty simple for us to get at least an idea of, at least for the first part of it, where it tells us objects at rest stay at rest. That's pretty obvious. Usually your keyboard doesn't just fly away. You have to lift it up or do something to it to make it move. So we've got a uh, kite, a rocket, a ball and a jet airplane. All of these things don't move on their own. There needs to be a force somehow applied to it to get it to move. Now the less obvious part is that once that object is in motion it will continue to be in motion unless another force acts upon it. So normally when we move something on earth it stops moving. It falls to the ground, it comes to a rest, for various reasons, because there are forces that we cannot see at work on it, mostly gravity, sometimes air resistance, sometimes friction. But if we move those objects into space and we apply enough force to them, they will keep moving forever and ever and ever and ever unless something stops them or acts upon them. So once that object's moving, it'll keep moving. And if you stop an object in space, it'll stay stopped unless something acts upon it. So here's kind of a picture of a rocket. And if we think about what's happening in rocket flight, there is definitely the first law of motion in play there. In play there. So when that rocket is sitting on the launch pad, it's not gonna launch itself. It needs to have that thrust, that blue arrow, pushing up and pushing that rocket into space. Now, if the force of that thrust is not strong enough to overcome the weight and the air resistance, it's not going anywhere. Okay, or if the thrust is just barely strong enough to lift it, but not enough to overcome it, you'll have a rocket failure and it'll crash. So the second law of motion so, we've talked about this one a lot too. And this one is another one of those laws that it does make sense to us. It tells us a larger object takes a larger force to move. So, if you're thinking about something coming at you and you're saying, well, if I had to make a choice between a 300 pound boulder hitting me at 10 miles an hour or a crumpled up piece of paper hitting me at 100 miles an hour. Hmm. I mean, I would rather someone didn't throw a piece of paper at me, but if I had to choose between a piece of paper, very light, going 100 miles an hour, which is pretty fast, but again, it's very light. It's not going to hurt me. I'll just have my feelings hurt. I'll be like, hey, you really threw that piece of paper hard at me. But, a boulder falling at any speed, 10 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, it is going to be disastrous. 
Okay, so if we look at that equation, force equals mass times acceleration. The mass gives it a lot of force. So that boulder falling at 10 miles an hour is going to be bad news. Okay? Now the fact that it's falling at 10 miles an hour or rolling at 10 miles an hour, that's okay. I might be able to get out of the way of that. But if we just have to sit there and let one of them hit us, I would pick the piece of paper. Okay? So that is a major hint for you guys in taking your quiz. Would you rather get hit by a boulder that weighs 300 pounds moving at 10 miles an hour or a piece of paper moving at 100 miles an hour? Pick the paper, okay? So this is the more advanced calculations that involve Newton's second law because the, new, the second law, even though it is intuitive to us and tells us, yes, we, we need to apply a greater force to a larger object to get it to move at the same rate, there's a lot of variables. So once you get an object moving, there's a lot of changes happening, particularly uh, on Earth. You have all kinds of different frictions and forces at play. But again, it all comes down to force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, so let's not forget that one. The third law of motion. The third law of motion is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So we're looking at a balloon here and the air rushes out of the bottom of the balloon and the balloon goes in the opposite direction. And we can even see it with those two arrows. The arrows are in opposition to each other. They're going in opposite directions. One's going down, one's going up. The air goes down, balloon goes up. So the third law of motion, for every action, there is an equal an opposite reaction. And here we see it uh, in visual form for a rocket. So we see the thrust of the rocket going one way, the rocket goes the other. Okay. And here we've got our rocket pictures. We've seen this before. So when a rocket takes off and we think about which laws of motion are in effect. Okay, so we the first law of motion definitely because that rocket's not going to move itself, so it needs something to act upon it. First law of motion. Second law of motion, yep. The second law of motion is in effect there too because the bigger the rocket, the bigger the force we're going to need, right? So if we want to go to the moon, we're going to need a big force. And then the third law of motion. Well, there it is. The third law of motion tells us for every action there's an equal opposite reaction. Another name for the third law of motion is the rocket law. So, the rocket law tells us there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's the third law of motion. So I'm counting first law, second law, third law. So all three laws of motion are in effect for rocket travel. So we look at our different pictures of rockets here and we have a solid propelled rocket and we have a liquid propelled rocket. And we've talked about this before. The liquid propelled rockets are mostly what they use to send things in space. And one of the reasons why they do that is because you can turn off and turn on a liquid propelled rocket, which is very good if something goes wrong. You can also accelerate it. You can turn it up and turn it down. It, that is very hard to do with a solid propelled rocket. Usually once you launch a solid propelled, or ignite, excuse me, a solid propelled rocket, it does not turn off. So liquid propellant is mostly what propels rockets. Solid propellant sometimes, but it is mostly the liquid propelled rockets that propel it, okay? So it's not the solid fuel, even though that does happen, it is pretty rare, all right? And so we have another view here of the forces against a rocket. So the thrust is what's getting it off the ground. Gravity and the drag from the atmosphere are what are pulling it down. So I hope you guys remember this one because this is a really great experiment. And this is telling us that gravity pulls equally on all objects, regardless of mass. 
So here we can see in this still shot of the video, we have the bowling ball and the feather. Now, if I were to drop them right now here in the classroom, the bowling ball is going to land first, right? Yep. So if we take all the air out of this classroom, and I'm not in it, we can do this experiment and really see the effects of gravity. Because when we drop it here in the classroom, air resistance is getting involved and it holds that feather up and the bowling ball just falls right through the air. So let's watch this video again so that we can remember. So we saw it, it fell exactly the same rate. So both the feather and the bowling ball fell together at the same rate because gravity pulls equally on all objects regardless of the size. So you could drop a feather, a bowling ball, a truck, a piano. You could drop all of those things in that vacuum chamber and they would all hit the ground at the same time. A feather, a truck, a bowling ball, a piano, all of them are gonna hit at the same time because gravity pulls equally on all objects. So another question that we get about space, and this happens a lot, is, is space cold or is space hot? And the answer is it depends on your location. It depends on where you're at. So this astronaut here on one side of this astronaut's body is in the sun. And that's the 250 degree side of his body. Over here, it's negative 250 degrees. So it is very, very cold on that side. So the answer, space is both hot and cold at the same time. And it depends on where you're at. So let's watch our solar system video so that we know where we're at in the universe. The solar system. 
our home in space. We live in a peaceful part of the Milky Way. Our home is the solar system. A four and a half billion year old formation that races around the galactic center at 200,000 kilometers per hour and circles it once every 250 million years. Our star, the sun, is at the center of the solar system. It's orbited by eight planets, trillions of asteroids and comets, and a few dwarf planets. The eight planets are divided into four planets like ours. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Mercury is the smallest and lightest of all the planets. A Mercury year is shorter than a Mercury day, which leads to enormous fluctuations in temperature. Mercury does not have an atmosphere or a moon. Venus is one of the brightest objects in the solar system, and by far the hottest planet, with atmospheric pressure that is 92 times higher than on Earth. An out-of-control greenhouse effect means that Venus never cools below 437 degrees Celsius. Venus also doesn't have a moon. Earth is our home, and the only planet with temperatures that are moderate enough to allow for a surplus of liquid water. Furthermore, it's so far the only place where life is known to exist. The Earth has one moon. Mars is the second smallest planet in the solar system, and hardly massive enough to keep a very thin atmosphere. Its Olympus Mons is the largest mountain in the solar system, more than three times as high as Mount Everest. Mars has two small moons. Jupiter is the largest and most massive planet in the solar system. It consists largely of hydrogen and helium, and is the theater for the largest and most powerful storms we know. Its largest storm, the Great Red Spot, is three times as large as Earth. Jupiter has 67 moons. Saturn is the second largest planet and possesses the smallest density of all the planets. If you had a sufficiently large bathtub, Saturn would swim in it. Saturn is also known for its extended, very visible ring system. It has 62 moons. Uranus is the third largest planet and one of the coldest. Of all the gas giants, it's also the smallest. The special thing about Uranus is that its axis of rotation is tilted sideways in contrast to the seven other planets. It has 27 moons. Neptune is the last planet in the solar system and is similar to Uranus. It's so far removed from the sun that a Neptune year is 164 Earth years long. The highest wind speed ever measured was in a storm on Neptune at just under 2,100 kilometers per hour. Neptune has 14 moons. If we compare the sizes of the planets, the differences between them become even clearer. Jupiter is the leader in terms of size and weight. Small Mercury, on the other hand, is even smaller than one of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede. Jupiter is so massive that alone it contains roughly 70% of the mass of all the other planets and has a massive impact on its surroundings. That's a blessing for Earth, since Jupiter draws most of the dangerously large asteroids that could wipe out life on Earth. But even Jupiter is a dwarf in comparison to our star, the Sun. Calling it massive does not do justice to the Sun. It makes up 99.86% of the mass in our solar system. For the most part, it consists of hydrogen and helium. Only less than 2% is made up of heavy elements like oxygen or iron. At its core, the sun fuses 620 million tons of hydrogen each second and generates enough energy to satisfy mankind's needs for years. But not only the eight planets orbit our sun, trillions of asteroids and comets also circle it. Most of them are concentrated into two belts, the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and the Kuiper belt at the edge of the solar system. These belts are home to countless objects, some as large as a dust particle, 
others the size of dwarf planets. The most well-known object in the asteroid belt is Ceres. The most well-known objects in the Kuiper belt are Pluto, Makemake, -Make, and Haumea. Usually, we describe the asteroid belt as a dense collection of bodies that constantly collide. But in fact, the asteroids are distributed across an area that is so indescribably large that it's even difficult to see two asteroids at once. Despite the billions of objects in them, the asteroid belts are fairly empty places. And nonetheless, there are collisions over and over again. The mass of both belts is also unimpressive. The asteroid belt has a little less than 4% of our moon's mass. And the Kuiper belt is only between 1 25th and 1 10th of Earth's mass. One day the solar system will cease to exist. The sun will die and Mercury, Venus and maybe Earth too will be destroyed. In 500 million years it will become hotter and hotter until at some point it will melt Earth's crust. Then the sun will grow and grow and either swallow Earth or at least turn it into a sea of lava. When it has burnt up all its fuel and lost most of its mass, it will shrink to a white dwarf and burn gently for a few billion more years before it goes out entirely. Then, at the latest, life in the solar system will no longer be possible. The Milky Way will not even notice it. A small part of it, in one of its arms, will become just a tiny bit darker. And, and mankind will cease to exist, or leave the solar system in search of a new home. So that is our home, the solar system, and out of that solar system, the majority of it is made up of the sun. So much so that everything is fairly insignificant in comparison to the sun. The sun is enormous. You can see that little dot down there, that's Earth. Even Jupiter, which is huge, is pretty darn tiny. And these are the planets most like Earth. And you can see that uh, Mercury, Pluto, and Mars are pretty small compared to Earth. But Venus, out of all of the objects in the solar system, it is closest to us in size. But really, in all the other terms, it couldn't be more different. It's super hot. It's poisonous. There's no water. It'd be a terrible place to live. But... In terms of its physical size, it is closest to Earth in its physical size. All right, guys, one last time, or ha, no, no way, we'll hear this again. But one last time today.
All right, my friends. That should leave you with some extra time for you to go to your Google Classroom and take the quiz. You must take the quiz in the Google Classroom. All fourth and fifth graders are gonna do it. That's how I know that what I'm doing is sinking in and is effective and is working. If you guys don't take the quiz or the scores on the quiz are poor, um, I need to start over, okay? I need to do something different because I did something wrong. So you guys, please take the quiz and enjoy the rest of your school day. Thank you guys very much.